Um, I wanted to announce that the uh, tutorial this afternoon on GPU computing uh, will be in this room. Um, to, uh, so please come here, uh, I think it's 2.30, uh, for Bill Dorland's uh, first tutorial on GPU computing. Okay, so uh, I'm going to give a series of four lectures on grid-based methods for hydro, MHD, and radiation hydrodynamics. Uh, you're starting to see a different style between the lectures. I'm going to use all PowerPoint slides. I thought it was great that Vocker used the blackboard mostly. That made it seem more like a school than a conference. Uh, Scott, as you saw, was mixed, both used both. I'm afraid I'm going to use almost all PowerPoint. Um, has, a, has the advantage that it, I have more material that's organized, keeps it straight for me. Has the very big disadvantage that there's more material, which means I'll probably go faster, I'll probably talk quicker. I often tend to talk too quickly, so the way to stop that is to ask me questions, to interrupt me. I'm happy to answer questions at any point uh, along the way. So, uh, oh, and I should announce that the, uh, this lecture is available as a PDF file uh, off my web page right now, but I believe Peter Toybin will have it on the uh, wiki pages very quickly. And my goal is to have all of these lectures as PDF files beforehand, before every lecture, uh, you can download them and make notes as we go along, uh, if you like. So, uh, here's my outline for the four lectures. Today, I, because we have four, I have enough room to spread things out a little bit. I wanted to start today with an introduction to the physics and the numerics. Uh, I'm going to spend about half the lecture talking about fluid dynamics and about half the lecture talking about basic numerical analysis. And I won't start talking about more advanced topics, uh, you know, specific application codes until next lecture, where I'll start talking about operator split, or what I would call Zeus-like methods. Uh, lecture three will be on more advanced PPM-like methods, Godunov methods. I'll mostly be focusing on Athena for that lecture. However, the, the uh, topic, uh, you know, the, the content will be applicable to a wide variety of Godunov codes that are now available for doing MHD. And I'll mention some of those lecture will be on radiation hydrodynamics. Uh, that's really an area of research right now. Um, it's an area where there's a lot of progress, and there really isn't uh, uh, many or, or any uh, generally available radiation hydro codes you can download to do sort of any problem in radiation hydro. So I'm going to talk more about the development of methods in that final lecture. Um, okay, uh, homework problems. Uh, they're going to be posted on the wiki uh, before tomorrow's after, uh, afternoon's uh, homework session. You can start with the warm-up exercise. If you've already done the warm-up ex exercise, you're ahead of the game. Uh, if not, then I encourage you to do that exercise, and today's lecture will help you a lot with that. Uh, and there'll be a full set of problems on the wiki before the, next, uh, before the first Q&A tomorrow. Okay, so today's lecture, I'm going to start by, you know, try to motivate why we're interested in doing fluid dynamics numerically. For this audience, I probably don't need to motivate it, uh, but uh, it provides a nice start to the lectures. These equations of MHD, and I'll talk about some basic physics, uh, waves, shocks, and instabilities. And then I'll do some basic numerical analysis of what so-called hyperbolic PDEs, which are, of which the equations of MHD are an example. And then I'll talk about some basic difference. <coughs> some aspect of those problems is a fluid dynamical problem. And, uh, my favorite picture from the Hubble Space Telescope, one of the most famous pictures ever taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, are the uh, columns of molecular glass, uh, glass gas in the Eagle Nebula, uh, M16. Uh, and to understand the structure and the dynamics requires solving MHG equations. That's a fluid. That, uh, it's a gas. It's a uh, collisional. And, uh, uh, its dynamics is really determined by fluid dynamics plus radiation because there, these columns are being ablated. You can see very clearly these uh, evaporation flows coming off the, the tops of the columns due to the uh, radiation field from hot stars nearby. You may wonder why there's a little arrow sitting there. Uh, you can ask me later, I guess. Uh, and some of this is a fluid, too. Another dramatic picture from HST is the Whirlpool Galaxy. You can see amazing structure in the interstellar medium of this galaxy, uh, spurs and spiral arms in the molecular gas. Uh, and you might think, well, that's the only fluid there, but in fact, the stars themselves, of course, are fluids too. Uh, of course, how those stars move in the dark matter potential, that's really better treated as an n-body problem. But 
The stars, everything you see here is a fluid. And if you want to understand internal structure of stars, it's all fluid dynamics. So what equations do we use? Uh, the equations of MHD. There are many ways to derive these equations. Uh, in fact, uh, the one I like uh, is to derive them from the collisional Boltzmann equation. There are simply moments, velocity moments uh, of the collisional Boltzmann equation. And fortunately, uh, you can find a, a closure relation for the system of moment equations. There's a relationship between the zeroth and second moment, an equation of state, because it's collisional and so the particles are in statistical equilibrium. Um, so that's one direct way to derive the equations. Uh, but another way is just sort of from basic physical principles. They're, they're basically statements of uh, conservation laws. And given that, you can almost write them down uh, uh, directly. I mean, that's not the way that Euler or Navier-Stokes derived the equations from taking moments of the Boltzmann equation. Instead, they derived them fr from these, these uh, conservation principles, like mass conservation. Mass can't be created or destroyed, so the rate of change of mass in a volume is just, has to be equal to the divergence of the flux of mass through the surface of that volume. So if I take any small volume of the fluid, the amount of mass enclosed by this has to be just the, the rate of uh, the divergence of the mass fluxes. The mass fluxes are rho v, and so d rho dt, the rate of change of the mass density is just this divergence. Um, so I've introduced the so-called Eulerian derivative, the time rate of change at a fixed point in space. Uh, and uh, most of what I talk about will be Eulerian methods in which we, we are fixed, have a fixed grid in space and are trying to solve the equations in a fixed coordinate system in space. But also, you can write the equations using so-called Lagrangian derivatives, often represented by large d by dt. And that's moving with the flow. That, in that case, there's a v dot grad operator uh, introduced. That's the case where you're looking at changes uh, in a frame of reference which is advecting with the flow. It's like the difference between standing on the bank of a river and watching the flow go by, that would be the Eulerian derivative, versus being on a boat in the river and floating downstream and watching the changes going around, ar around you. That would be the Lagrangian derivative. And so there's a simple transformation between these two, and some codes use the Lagrangian frame to solve the equations, and there are advantages to that, and there are disadvantages to that. But in multi-dimensions, uh, most modern methods are going to use the Eulerian frame, and that's the one I'll adopt mostly. Uh, so in addition to mass conservation, we have momentum conservation. Once again, the time rate of change of the momentum density in the volume has to be just a divergence of the flux of momentum. And what is the flux of momentum? It, it's uh, the stress on the surface of the volume, and there are several components to that stress. There's so-called Reynolds stress. That's momentum transport by the fluid itself and uh, the velocity fluctuations in the fluid, then there's a stress associated with a magnetic field, the Maxwell stress. Part of it is in this B dot, uh, this BB tensor, and part of it is buried in the definition of the pressure here. P, P star is really the gas pressure plus, plus the magnetic pressure. And then finally, the pressure itself represents a momentum flux, and so the stresses on the surface of the, of the volume uh, produce changes in the momentum a density in the volume. So that's the second conservation law. The last is energy conservation, where capital E is the total energy in the volume, the sum of kinetic plus internal plus magnetic energy. The sum of all these energies is conserved. Uh, it can only change due to the rate of en energy flux to the surface, and that has a contribution due to the enthalpy flux and a contribution due to the, to the pointing flux through the magnetic field. It's not obvious. Uh, where this equation comes from. It takes a little bit of analysis. For example, the pointing flux E cross B, well, we need a, f uh, a form for the electric field E. Turns out in ideal MHD, which we've adopted here, the electric field is uh, minus V cross B. We'll see that in a second. So I've used that to simplify this equation into this form. So we have these three conservation laws, mass, momentum, and energy. And then in, in MHD, we also have, in ideal MHD, we also have a flux conservation law given by Maxwell's equations. This, uh, these two, are, uh, two equations are two of Maxwell's equations. They give you the time rate of change of the magnetic field in terms of the electric field. And this is not an evolutionary equation. It's a constraint equation. Div B is zero. There are no mo magnetic monopoles. This is going to be an important constraint that our numerical methods are going to have to satisfy. So we're going to have to work hard to build methods that satis satisfy this equation uh, uh, numerically. Uh, but this is our evolutionary equation. 
from Ohm's law, the current and the electric field are related. Uh, but for an ideal MHD, that is an infinitely conducting plasma, the conductivity goes to infinity, and so this uh, term in the, in the parentheses has to be zero, and so E is uh, minus V cross B. Well, CE is minus V cross B, and that's what I used in the, uh, for the pointing flux, and indeed substituted into the uh, induction equation, and you get the evolutionary equation for the magnetic field. Uh, now, if you integrate this equation over areas, then you can use Stokes theorem here and show that the magnetic flux is conserved, moduli the electric field around the, the line integral of the electric field around the edges of the, of the area. So this is an area conservation law, not a volume conservation law. Uh, it says that, that ma the uh, magnetic field integrated over some area is conserved, or at least the rate of change of the magnetic field uh, in that area is related to the electric field at the, at the edges of that area. And that, again, is going to be a fundamental difference between the earlier conservation laws, which are per volume, and it's going to suggest a very different way of integrating these equations numerically. So these equations involve divergences, and this equation involves a curl, and it suggests a different way of discretizing the equations, which we'll get to uh, tomorrow, sorry, uh, on Thursday and, and the third lecture. So these are the equations of compressible, inviscid, Ideal MHD. Ideal MHD because we assume the conductivity is infinite, which is suitable for a fully ionized plasma. We'll come back to that in later lectures. Inviscid because we didn't have any explicit Navier-Stokes type viscosity. Uh, these are the Euler equations, not the Navier-Stokes equations. And finally, compressible because we didn't make any assumption of incompressibility. And there they all cataloged, you know, continuity equation, momentum equation, energy equation, and induction equation, where once again there's the definition of total energy, and once again the definition of total pressure, P star, gas plus magnetic. Now these are more unknowns than equations here. We have to find some equation for the pressure, that's the equation of state, and as I mentioned before, that comes from thermodynamics and the fact that this is a fluid and so it's collisional and so it's in its equi equilibrium. Oh, by the way, uh, I tend to be sloppy with units, I'm afraid. Uh, I've written these equations in units such that mu is one. Uh, uh, I've heard it said and I would agree that God's units are Gaussian units. Uh, that's the units we should all be using. Uh, that introduces lots of four pi's around and the four pi's are easily buried into the magnetic field. And I tend to do that a lot. So be careful uh, in, in units uh, here. So for example, suddenly there's a four pi appearing, uh, being sloppy here, but, but uh, uh, you can sort that out. I'm sure you can sort that out. So here are the same equations written in non-conservative form. Uh, continuity equation, uh, still in conservative form, but I've split the momentum equation into terms on the right-hand side that look like source terms, pressure gradients and Lorentz forces. And uh, similarly, the energy equation, no longer solving the total energy equation, but now an internal energy equation. Small e is the internal energy density, uh, and that's not conserved. And uh, it'll turn out that this is a convenient form for some of the numerical methods I'll be talking about. In fact, whether you should solve the total energy or the internal energy uh, is a choice that you sometimes have to make. There are advantages and disadvantages of both, and we'll, we'll get back to that. This is a very useful form for methods based on operator splitting, which I'll be talking about next in the next lecture. Okay, so uh, I mentioned we have this closure we need, the equation of state, and uh, I shouldn't be telling you anything new here. This is just to, you know, catalog what you already know. I think that uh, we, typically we adopt an ideal gas law, equate an ideal equation of state. This uh, assumes that the particles are sort of uh, billiard balls that are bouncing off each other. Uh, not, not, they don't stick, all the collisions are elastic, and so uh, P is just NKT. Uh, you can turn that into an equation which involves only the internal energy density just by uh, using the fact that each degree of freedom has energy KT over two. Uh, so the internal energy density for an ideal gas with M internal degrees of freedom is just M times the number density N times the energy per degree of freedom KT over two. And I just basically eliminate KT from these equations uh, using this here, and I'll get that P is gamma minus 1 over E, where gamma is just uh, a number which depends on the number of degrees of freedom. Uh, other ways to derive the same equation, gamma is also the ratio of the specific heats in the gas. Uh, 
Uh, so for a monatomic gas where there's three degrees of freedom, uh, gamma is five thirds, uh, m plus two over m is five thirds. But for a diatomic gas where you also have vibrational and rotational degrees of freedom, then m is five and then gamma is seven fifths. Uh, and if you're doing so, if you're doing molecular gas, you know, dynamics of molecular gas, you can usually use seven fifths. Most calculations use monatomic gas fi gamma five thirds. It's also common to use an isothermal equation of state. P is just some number C squared. Uh, C is the isothermal sound speed times rho, so P is just proportional to rho. Uh, and that's appropriate when the radiative cooling time is much less than dynamical time, so that the gas is always held at the same temperature. The thermodynamic processes are so rapid that no matter what the dynamics does to the internal energy density, it just immediately equilibrates again to the same constant temperature. There has to be both cooling and heating going on in the flow. It turns out that that's a very strange equ equation of state. I mean, it's very convenient, but sometimes you scratch your head and you wonder what you're really doing here, because it says that even in adiabatic expansions, there's some process that is magically heating the fluid back up to it exactly the same temperature all the time. And, so, and it also changes the dynamics in fundamental ways. So, while it's very useful and it's quite common to use it, and I use it a lot too, sometimes it's interesting to think about what does it really mean to be using an isothermal equation of state, and is it applicable, and what are you losing uh, when you use that equation of state? It's very convenient because it makes the energy equation go away. You don't need to solve the energy equation anymore because uh, you have the pressure directly proportional to the density. You've eliminated one variable by using this, this isothermal equation of state. Of course, in other circumstances, the ideal gas law is not appropriate at all, and you must use more complex or maybe even tabular equations of state. For example, if you're studying the, uh, neutron stars or nuclear matter, uh, gamma ray bursts and so on, the central engines of gamma ray bursts, then uh, it's not appropriate. Neither one of these equations of state is appropriate, and so you need some other kind. And your method, it's important to, in that case, adopt a numerical method which can be extended to general equations of state. Some methods are fundamentally built on the assumption of an ideal gas law, in which case those methods are not going to be extendable to these more complicated situations. You may have to modify your numerical methods if your equation of state is more complicated. Okay, so uh, let's put this together with uh, some of the sort of mathematical properties of these equations and their solutions. So here they are again. I've dropped the MHD and I'm just going to look at the hydro just to make it a little bit simpler. Just look at the hydro equations. They're all written in this, you know, time derivative plus divergence of a flux equals zero. So you can write them all in a very compact form. du dt plus df dx is zero, in one dimension at least, where I, so I've restricted the divergence to 1d. So u is a vector of the conserved variables, the density, the momentum, components of the momentum, and the total energy. And f are the fluxes, it's a vector of the fluxes of those variables, so rho vx is the flux of rho, and so on. Um, and so it's a, uh, it's a very compact way to write this system of conservation laws. Now you can also rewrite this equation uh, using the Jacobian df du, uh, du dx, uh, and you can recognize this as a hyperbolic partial differential equation because it contains a first derivative in time and a first derivative in space. Uh, so these, this system of equations is a system of hyperbolic PDEs. If df du, if Jacobian's a constant, we have a very simple linear hyperbolic PDE. We have the linear advection equation. Uh, and we'll use that to, in, a, in a moment to generate solutions. Um, and there's a lot of analysis, a lot of mathematical analysis on hyperbolic PDEs, which we can use to understand our methods and, and what they should be doing. Uh, one slight twist is that it turns out the equations of MHD are not actually so-called strictly hyperbolic. And I'll get to that in, in a minute as well. So uh, we can get a solution to these equations, a time-dependent solution, in a very simple case very quickly. If we assume the pressure and the velocity, the x component of the velocity is constant, then uh, you can uh, find very simple time dependent, uh, uh, very simple solutions because, because in that case, uh, df du is just this constant velocity vx. So for example, take the first component, the mass flux, uh, the derivative of this with respect to rho is just vx, which is the constant. Similarly, the components of the momentum, uh, the derivative of this with respect to rho vx is just vx, a constant. And for all of these uh, equations, the derivative with respect to the component of u is just vx. And so we get 
Again, this uh, simple linear advection equation, du dt plus vx, a constant du dx is zero. And that just has the solution that uh, whatever the initial condition was, it's, it's just uh, displaced uh, a distance vxt at any later time. The solution remains the same spatial shape, it's just displaced a constant amount vxt uh, uh, at, uh, at later times. So that any, any later time, it's just the initial conditions displaced by a constant amount vxt. So the density field moves with the flow, but it doesn't change its shape. And similarly, the transverse momentum, vy and vz, will move with the flow without changing its shape. Uh, if there are discontinuities in the density, they will just advect with the flow. And these are so-called contact discontinuities. So uh, we can introduce discontinuous solutions which move with the flow. They're discontinuous changes in the density in which the pressure is constant across the discontinuity, and those are called contact discontinuities, and they'll just move with the flow. Now, that, so that's the very sort of simplest time-dependent solution I think you can imagine. The next simplest uh, is to uh, realize that these equations admit solutions which are waves. That is, they admit wave-like solutions. So I can write down any of the variables u as a. Let me just call a one of the components of u. A is just some uh, initial value, a naught, plus some perturbation amplitude, a1, uh, times this exponential factor where k, of course, is the wave uh, vector and omega is the frequency. And when a1 is small compared to a0, then these waves are small amplitude and they're linear. And when a1 is large or comparable to a0, then these waves are nonlinear and these solutions don't persist and something interesting will happen to them, and as we'll see. And here's an example, a calculation, actually. It's a test problem in Athena is to uh, fo follow the propagation of sound waves in multi-dimensions or thought, you know, at a, sorry, at a bleak angle to the grid. Uh, and there's a movie. You just see this wave just propagates in this periodic boundary condition as long as you want to go. So linear waves are produced by small amplitude disturbances. It's, you know, V small compared to the sound speed, sound waves. What you're listening to right now is a linear disturbance in the room. Uh, and uh, we can write down the dispersion relation for these hydrodynamic waves. That is, we can just substitute this solution back into the uh, original hydro equations, and we can drop the higher order terms, any term that involves, which is second order or higher in the perturbation amplitudes, we can drop because there's going to be very small compared to the leading order terms. And the uh, time derivatives turn into I omegas, and the uh, the um, space derivatives turns into IKs, and so it turns out we turn those differential equations into a set of algebraic equations. Uh, it's a linear system which has constant coefficients. We can solve that pretty directly. We get what's called a dispersion relation. It's a relationship between the frequency and wave number uh, for the solutions. And uh, it can be re you know, uh, recast into the form that I've boxed down here, and you can it's convenient because you can immediately see that there are uh, apparently five different solutions to this equation, three of which are advection modes, have zero frequency, and two of which uh, have, uh, are, are, are waves, true waves with a phase velocity c, the sound speed. Why three advection modes? Why not just one? because uh, two of them were associated with the transverse components of the velocity. I wrote this as a vector here. So the transverse Vy and the transverse Vz, they advect, and they're independent advection modes, and so there's, in, in fully three-dimensional, you know, if the vectors are three-dimensional but written in 1D, there are three entropy waves uh, and two sound waves. Okay. Uh, so we have a very basic property of these uh, equations of hydrodynamics, they're solutions. We have two kinds. We have entropy waves in which you're advecting constant density or constant uh, uh, you know, uh, transverse momentum, which just move with the flow. So for example, you could put a sine wave in the density and a constant Vx, and the sine wave would just translate uh, without changing its shape. Or you can have sound waves, which represent true propagating disturbances in which the density, velocity, and pressure all fluctuate, and these fluctuations propagate at 
uh, in two directions, both V plus C and V minus C. For, and that's why there were two modes here that have the same phase velocity. It's because one wave goes to the left and one wave goes to the right. Uh, and so there's two independent modes here. And so these represent compressions and rarefactions which propagate at the sound speed. And they're superimposed on top of this background flow V, which would be the, would be the evection. So that's hydro, and then uh, you can do the same analysis for MHD. Uh, you can substitute that plane wave solution into the equations of MHD. You can assume a uniform homogeneous background, and in which case the uh, A naught is a constant. And uh, you can uh, set V naught equal to zero. Why not choose it stationary? If it's not stationary, you can always transform to a frame in which it is stationary. So it's perfectly general to assume V naught is zero. You get a much more complicated dispersion relation whose der derivation requires a couple of pages. See Jackson. It's, uh, you know, it's worth, uh, you'll be strengthened by doing it. So it's worth going through the analysis in Jackson to see the derivation of the dispersion relation. And it's, this is a very convenient way to write it. Uh, you can see, first of all, that it's a six-order polynomial, so I should expect three modes here, uh, one propagating the left and right in each case. And one of those modes is immediately obvious. It's in this square bracket here. Notice that when K is perpendicular to the magnetic field, VA here is defined as the alphane speed, the magnetic field divided by 4 pi over the square root of the density. When K is perpendicular to VI, VA, this mode has zero frequency. It's, it's non-propagating. It's non uh, so that we're going to call this the alphane mode. And then there's two other modes associated with this quartic here. A little more complicated to see, it's going to end up having some phase velocity that depends on the alphane speed and the sound speed in some way. Turns out that these are the alphane waves, propagated VA, that's this mode here, and the slow and fast magnetosonic waves, which propagate at the slow magnetosonic speed and the fast magnetosonic speed, which I'm not going to write down here, but they're... Uh, there, you know, you can, you can do the algebra and work them out. Of course, there's entropy modes present as well. So rather than having only one mode as in hydrodynamics, the sound wave, now we have three modes, the alphane and the fast and slow magnetosonic waves. And these alphane waves are, you know, uh, they're like disturbances on the string. The magnetic field uh, is being perturbed transversely, and those perturbations are propagating down the magnetic field. It's the magnetic tension force that's the restoring force for these waves. So they propagate like sort of waves down a string. And they're incompressible. Uh, there's no, uh, you know, div V is zero for these waves, a very important property. And then there's the fast and slow magnetosonic waves, which represent compressible perturbations of both the field and the gas. And you can either have those compressions in phase in which case you have fast waves, both the magnetic pressure and the gas pressure are in phase, and so in some sense you have the maximum restoring force because the pressure fluctuations are combining in phase, you know, constructive interference, so you get a very fast propagating wave, the fast mode, or the perturbations in the gas pressure and magnetic pressure may be out of phase, in which case they're sort of destructively interfering with one another, and so the restoring force is reduced, and so the wave propagation is speed is lower, and so that's the slow magnetosonic wave. So here's the explicit expression I have written out for you, the explicit expression for the fast and slow magnetosonic waves. Okay, uh, and a good way to catalog these waves are these so-called Friedrichs diagrams. They're polar diagrams showing you the phase velocity uh, be, uh, as a function of angle and magnetic field strength. You see, it's getting complicated because the wave the phase velocities depend on the angle between the wave vector and B, as well as the magnitude of B. So how do you represent all of that uh, graphically? You use these diagrams. How do you interpret these diagrams? Well, the, uh, the, per the vertical direction is the direction uh, parallel to the magnetic field, parallel to B naught. So if I were to imagine a wave vector along the magnetic field, it would lie along uh, the, 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 the vertical axis here. And then you would notice that there are two modes perpendicular, uh, sorry, parallel to the magnetic field. There is the slow magnetosonic wave, and then there is the alphane and the fast wave, which are the same thing in the case where the sound speed is less than the alphane speed. Uh, if I take some other angle slightly away from the magnetic field, so if I take K in this direction here, then I would have three intersections, and I would have three wave modes. I'd have the slow, the alphane, and the fast. And that's true for all angles between 0 and 90 degrees. At 90 degrees, I only have the fast mode. 
there. And then I go back, you know, it's the same angle as I go from 90 to 180, it's the same thing, uh, it's sort of symmetrical here. And that's the case where the sound speed is smaller than the alphane speed. Case where it's, it's higher than the alphane speed, uh, then the, this situation uh, switches. So now I have, uh, I, if I take a wave vector parallel to the magnetic field, the fast mode here propagates at the sound speed now, not the alphane speed. Uh, and the alphane and the slow are degenerate now on, uh, here. And as I go at any angle in between here, between zero and 90, I'll have three independent modes, the slow, the alphane, and the fast. But when I'm at 90 degrees, I'm back to only having the fast here. And you see this, this tells you how complicated this gets because you see there aren't necessarily three independent wave modes for all Ks and Bs and all, on all magnetic field strengths. Uh, in the, in the language of hyperbolic PDEs, the eigenvalues, which are the characteristic speeds of these waves, are not all linearly independent in all cases. So these equations are not strictly hyperbolic. Uh, they are hyperbolic in many circumstances for many K and B, but in some cases these eigenmodes are degenerate. For example, in this case, the alphane and the fast mode are degenerate, they're the same thing. So it can, you can see that building numerical methods is gonna get complicated because we have to be able to adaptively move between cases where there's only one wave mode to cases where there's all three wave modes. Your numerical solver has to be completely robust and able to handle any K dot B and any magnetic field strength and be able to give you the right answer for all of these different cases. And that's one, another reason why MHD is somewhat more complicated than hydro, because in hydro, what would this diagram look like? If I did a Friedrich's diagram for hydrodynamics, what would it look like? A circle, right? Because at any k, I have the same speed, uh, doesn't, it, it doesn't change with k. And there's only one mode, so there's just one circle there. So you go from a circle to these diagrams as you go from hydro to MHD. Okay, uh, <laughs> just to make things a little, little more complicated as well, uh, these wave modes can be polarized as well, especially the alphane mode is, can be polarized uh, because Alphane waves involve transverse velocities. And so in, in, uh, if there's more than one transverse uh, direction, then it's a linear combination of the perturbations in two orthogonal directions that determine the overall uh, perturbation in, in the wave. You can make a circularly polarized wave by the sum of two linearly polarized waves. Here's a nice movie that shows this. Like we start off from two linearly polarized waves which are offset uh, in phase such that the result is another linearly polarized wave at 45 degrees to the, to the original two perturbations. But if I now shift the phase between the red curve and the green curve, the perturbations in these two orthogonal directions, what happens to the overall direction of the perturbation? Well, watch what happens as you shift the phase of that wave. You see it becomes a circularly polarized wave, and as I shift it back, it becomes a linear polarized, then another circularly polarized, and then it goes back to linear polarized again. So you can have all polarizations for alphane waves depending on the phase and amplitude of the perturbations in the orthogonal directions. And that even in one dimension, MHD requires two transverse velocities in order to properly represent this physics. If you, if you adopt the assumption of 1D and then you drop the transverse components VY and VZ, which is something you can do in hydro, you'll get the wrong answer here. If you do, even if you say, well, let me just keep one component of the transverse velocity, you'll still get the wrong answer in MHE because you won't allow for these circularly polarized alphane waves. So e the simplest representation of MHD is one spatial dimension plus two transverse components to all vectors in order to get these transverse ways correct. So that's just the properties of linear waves. You know, let's move on a little bit here to something more interesting. Uh, these linear waves won't persist very long because we've ignored this V dot grad V term in the momentum equation, which went away when we did the linear analysis. You didn't see it, it was a sleight of hand, but if you'd gone through the analysis, you'd have seen that this term basically falls out of the equations uh, for linear waves. This term is important for producing wave steepening. We'll see it's, uh, you know, it looks an awful lot like Berger's equation, which if you're familiar with results in steepening solutions. You can ask how long does it take a linear wave to, be, to steepen into something nonlinear? Well, that requires the magnitude of this turn to be comparable to the, the uh, 
well, you, to the time derivative term dv dt, you can sort of approximate this term as just kv1 squared, so just approximate the spatial derivative with k and the time derivative with omega. So when kv1 squared is of order omega v1, these, this uh, the nonlinear term is comparable to the time dependent term, and that's true after uh, some number of wave periods n, omega over k over v1. So when, when v1 is small compared to omega over k, uh, then it's going to take a very long number of wavelengths for this to steepen. But when V1 is large or comparable to omega over K, it doesn't take very many wave periods for these waves to steepen. N could be a few when a V1 is comparable to omega over K. So these waves could steepen very quickly or they could take a very long time to steepen. Uh, why aren't they becoming shocks in this room when I talk? It's because uh, many things, one of which is that these are very low amplitude waves. Another is that there's sort of spherical dilution, geometrical dilution of the waves. And then finally, there is, there's, uh, there's microscopic dissipation, viscosity, and so on that are helping to reduce amplitudes of these waves. But left in an inviscid fluid, plane waves eventually always become shocks uh, in one dimension. Kind of interesting. No matter how small amplitude, eventually those waves would become shocks. So I think it's remarkable, maybe you don't, but I think it's remarkable that these PDEs admit discontinuous solutions. After all, Formally, the derivatives are going to infinite uh, in these discontinuous solutions. And so you've got infinities appearing in your equations, but they all work themselves out such that discontinuous solutions are perfectly valid uh, for these hyperbolic PDEs. Uh, we already talked about one. The simplest example is just a discontinuous density, which propagates as a contact discontinuity. Uh, but discontinuous changes in all variables are possible, and we would call those shocks. They can result from nonlinear steepening, as I just described, or from disturbances that at the very beginning were producing shocks because that the disturbance was propagating faster than the compressive wave speeds. In MHD, that would be the fast magnetosonic speed or the slow magnetosonic speed. A disturbance which propagates faster than the slow speed will produce a shock. Uh, it doesn't have to be faster than all wave speeds. Uh, you can have solutions in which div v is less than zero, which represent compression, and solutions which div v is greater than zero. But those solutions, so those, those are spontaneous rarefactions, decompressions. You can go through a discontinuous rarefaction. Mathematically, that's allowed, but physically, they're not because they violate entropy conditions. And so we don't have rarefaction shocks in nature, although the equations would allow them without this entropy condition. Uh, so the shocks are described by jump conditions. The changes in these conserved variables at this discontinuity. So there's an example of a disturbance propagating faster than the wave speed in the fluid. Uh, I'm told that if you're a pilot, this isn't something that you should do very much. Uh, the, uh, this this uh, cloud here is actually not the rare fact, or sorry, the shock front. This is the rare faction. There's a rare faction behind the airplane which is producing a, a rapid decompression of the air and making the vapor in the air condense into droplets, which you see. The shocks are actually at the tip of the plane, of course, and the tip of all the leading surfaces, and you can't see them because there are compressions and they don't change anything in, in the air that you can see visibly. But uh, this plane is not going much above the sound speed, and so the shock wave from the tip here is reflecting off the water and coming back up, which is what makes this uh, something that you shouldn't do very, very often. So this is an example that you might have seen or heard. Uh, but in, in, uh, in astrophysics, you can get disturbances which propagate faster than the sound speed. They're caused by supernova, by stellar outflows. Many, many, many processes produce flows which are faster than the sound speed. Why is that? Why does astrophysics produce so many supersonic flows? That's because typical flow velocities are set by gravitational freefall speeds. Whereas the sound speed is set by the thermodynamics, the heating and cooling, the temperature of the plasma. And those are often disconnected. You can have disturbances which are propagating at the free fall velocity where the thermodynamics doesn't know anything about the gravitational potential. And so the sound speed is much, much different than the free fall velocity and you get shocks and outflows at supersonic velocities. Here's an example, uh, many such examples, but here's one, a very, very pretty one again, of shock waves in the interstellar medium produced by a supernova this shock wave has become highly complex and its geometrical shape is very, very complicated. You are seeing the edge-on limb brightening of the shock front uh, and it's, it's been, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's corrugated and wrinkled as it propagates through a non-uniform 
uh, background medium. But every one of these little filaments is a portion of a shock front propagating through the interstellar medium. So we describe these shocks by jump conditions. Uh, so uh, let, I'm not going to drive them all. I just want to state how you come about with them. You, you, know, you imagine yourself in the frame of reference of the shock. You, uh, in that frame of reference, you see flow coming towards you at the upstream velocity and flowing away from you at the downstream velocity. You're standing at this point in space. Uh, actually, it's a uh, yeah, point in space moving with the shock front, and you're seeing flow coming at you and flow going away. And you must conserve all quantities in that frame. So mass, momentum, and energy are conserved. So you can write down that the mass flux downstream is the mass flux upstream for it to be conserved. And the momentum flux downstream is the momentum flux upstream. And the energy flux similarly are, uh, are the same. And so you get a set of equations which relate the downstream conditions with the subscript D to the upstream conditions with the subscript U. Now, there are more unknowns and equations, so the best that you can do here is solve them for the ratios between the downstream and the upstream quantities. So, for example, you get the ratio of the density in the downstream flow to the density in the upstream flow is this, is this formula here. The other things are somewhat more complicated. I won't write them down, but here's uh, sort of one of the most interesting ratios is the density ratio, where this factor M is the ratio between the upstream velocity and the upstream sound speed. And both can change across the shock. So you measure this only in the upstream frame. And that's the so-called Mach number. And these, these relationships, these ratios, are called the rankine hugonio jump conditions uh, for hydrodynamical shock. And uh, some of the important properties, if I take the high Mach number limit uh, of this jump ratio here, I can see that it just reduces to gamma plus 1 over gamma minus 1. So for hydrodynamical shock, the maximum jump ratio you can get is just gamma plus 1 over gamma minus 1. For gamma 5 thirds, that turns into 4. Uh, the transverse component of the velocity is unchanged through a hydrodynamical shock. Uh, and the downstream flow is always subsonic. The ratio of the downstream velocity to the downstream sound speed is always less than 1. That means that the shock is in causal contact with what's going on behind it. Disturbances in the downstream flow can propagate upstream to the shock and perturb it and uh, interact with it. We can do exactly the same thing for MHD. We can conserve mass, momentum, energy, and magnetic flux in the shock frame, and you can get the ranking hugo jump conditions for the MHD shocks. This is even more tedious to do. Once again, it's good for your soul to sit down and, go and work through the algebra and write down these jump conditions. It's tedious to write general jump conditions. I'll just talk about the results. Uh, you can have what are called alphane, quote, shocks unquote, or so-called rotational discontinuity. That's a better name. It's not, shock implies compression, and these modes don't have any compression. The Malfane waves are incompressible. These just represent a discontinuous change in the magnetic field, direction, and the transverse velocity, uh, which propagates at the Alfane speed. So you, you just twist the magnetic field discontinuously. It propagates down the magnetic field line as a discontinuous twist, and that you might call an Alfane shock or better, a rotational discontinuity. You can have slow shocks in which the field decompresses. The field direction is deflected towards the normal in that case. In the general case of an oblique magnetic field with respect to the shock front, then in this case, the field direction deflects towards the normal. Those occur when the disturbance is between the slow and the fast speed. You can have fast shocks when the disturbance is faster than the fast speed, in which case the field direction is deflected away from the normal. You can have Special cases, uh, which are kind of interesting, uh, maybe not so you know, fundamental to MHD physics, but still very interesting. You can have so-called switch-on shocks, where the upstream transverse component of B is zero. So B is normal to the shock front. But as it goes through the shock front, there's a discontinuous change in the transverse component. And you get a bend. Uh, so B upstream component B, uh, of transverse component zero upstream and non-zero downstream. Or you can have a switch-off shock. See, so switch on because the transverse component is switched on as you go through the shock. Or switch off where there's a non-zero transverse component which gets bent to zero through the shock, so the transverse component is switched off as you go through the shock. So is a switch on shock a slow shock or a fast shock? Well, you got two chances to get it right. 50-50, so who's, who's brave? 
It's a fast chuck. Why do you say fast? Now I'm making it hard for you. Because uh, the answer lies in the way the field is directed, right? So the, in this case, the field is being directed away from the normal as you go through the shock front. And here the field is being directed towards the normal as you go through the shock front. So the switch on is a fast and the switch off is a slow. So those are special examples for butterfly collecting of different things uh, of shocks. Now, that's all well and good for shocks, and uh, you know, you're know you probably familiar with them, and uh, maybe I'm not telling you anything new here. I'm just, again, trying to catalog this physics. Where it gets more interesting is when you get to multi-dimensions, because shocks can do a lot more interesting things in multi-dimensions, because they can start interacting with each other, and they can produce much more complex dynamics when they interact with each other. For example, you can have triple points, which are the interaction between two shocks. Uh, you can see that when two shocks collide, something weird has to happen downstream of their interaction because the two shocks may have different shock Mach numbers. So, for example, let me suppose I have media one in which there's a shock propagating into it with a certain Mach number M1 and another shock with a certain Mach number M2 and they're interacting at this point here. But the jump from this density to this density depends on this shock Mach number and the jump from that density to that density depends on this shock Mach number and they're different. So this density is not the same as that density. So something has to be connected here, usually a contact discontinuity. Uh, and so you get so-called triple points. But other more complicated things can happen at, at these interactions. You can get so-called baroclinic generation of vorticity when the pressure and density gradients are not parallel. You can generate vorticity and slip surfaces, which are discontinuous jumps in the transverse velocity. And the generation of vorticity by curved shocks and shock interactions in multi-dimensions is very important for the generation of turbulence in, in hydro and MHD flows. And uh, a good sort of example of this complexity is, this, is an, also a very classic test problem for hydrodynamics is the so-called double Mach reflection. Here's an, uh, result of the density. This is a, a contour diagram of the density at some late time for a shock interacting with a reflecting wall at an oblique angle. So the shock hits the wall, it bounces off, the reflected shock interacts with the incident shock, generates these triple points, you get a little jet produced along the wall. The best way to understand how, how all this happens is to watch a movie. And uh, if this goes well, we'll watch a movie. Uh, if not, we won't watch a movie. Here we go. Thinking, 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 thinking. This is perfectly fine by me. Okay, here we go. So here's a movie of the density. Uh, the upstream density is black. You can't see it's color black. You can't see it. The downstream density there is blue there. So here's the incident shock as it starts to interact with that wall. And then you see the reflected shock. The post, sh the density in the post-shock region of the reflected shock is, is much higher than before, and so it's this different red color. But you can see this, this complex, and all the actions happening right down in here. And you can see all of this complex features here all come from this multidimensional shock interaction. You would have never guessed all this was going to happen from one-dimensional fluid dynamics or using ranking Huguenot jump conditions in 1D. This all comes because it's multidimensional shock dynamics. And so multidimensional shock dynamics do all kinds of interesting things uh, which are fascinating in themselves. This little jet produces a vortex, it rolls up, all sorts of cool things happening in here. So this is obviously uh, a potential code test because the dynamics here is complicated enough to be interesting and it depends on the getting the shock dynamics right. So uh, let, me, let me move on from waves to shocks to instabilities. Uh, going beyond just the simplest solutions, these waves and, and instability or sh and shocks gets us into the zoo of MHD instabilities. And, and here this is where you need to take courses in fluid dynamics to begin to sort of you know, work your way through understanding of all of these different kinds of instabilities. I sort of catalog what I might think are the most important ones. And, you know, I think most of fluid dynamics and astrophysics is really all about understanding these instabilities. For example, one could, you know, boldly say that cosmology is number one. If I could just understand number one, then, you know, well, or we understand structure formation of the universe. Well, okay, there's some number two in there as well. And then it turns out that, well, actually there's three and four because, you know, there's shocks generated and the flow and so on. And there's also number five. And uh, maybe there's no, number six at some point in, if you make little, you know, quasar disks and so on. So 
the point is that all of these instabilities are absolutely fundamental to interpreting astrophysical systems, and most of what we do is trying to figure out the nonlinear regimes of these instabilities and understand what's going on. Uh, so why talk about them? Because we're going to de de develop numerical methods, and why are we developing these numerical methods? Because we want to understand these things. So we better understand these things so we understand what our tools are telling us. We must make sure our methods get these things correctly. But what does correctly even mean here? The, most, the dispersion relation for these instabilities predict that there is a very broad, sometimes infinite range of wave numbers which will be unstable. Perturbations of some wavelength will grow exponentially, and then when they get nonlinear, interesting things will happen. But we have to realize that grid codes are limited. They can only ever resolve wave numbers between some number n times the grid spacing delta x and the size of the computational domain L. You have a finite bandwidth available to you in your grid-based method. Uh, and n is some number which has to be bigger than 2 uh, and is a function of your numerical algorithm. You're trying to work very hard to make n as big as possible to reduce the truncation error so you accurately and, and reproduce the dynamics at small wavelengths on the grid. Uh, you want to improve the fidelity of your method so n is as small as possible. But even if you were to wor have the perfect method, you would never get beyond n equals 2. And even, you know, even that's a problem. So, uh, and the real issue here is that this, this truncation error, which dominates its, at uh, very small wave numbers, is not Galilean invariant. It uh, depends on the flow itself. The truncation error in grid methods depend on the solution itself. And so if you are studying problems in which the, the uh, dynamics is determined by the shortest wavelengths near the truncation error, you're going to find different answers in different frames, for example. Uh, and, but in that case, you're already studying problems which are unresolved, in which the solution in any frame is being dominated by the truncation error at the grid scale. So if you took that same problem and didn't go to a different frame of reference but just increased the resolution, you'd also get a different answer because you would move the bandwidth to a smaller wavelength, and modes that were unresolved before now become resolved, and so they're going to suddenly appear, and that's going to change the overall solution. And so, so correctly here is actually a non-trivial issue. Correctly really means that for a range of wave numbers that are resolved between, you know, wave numbers that are much bigger than the grid scale, so they're accurately represented, and smaller than the size of the domain, do you get the right answer? That's what we mean by correctly. And we have to realize that in nature, that nature has a much bigger band pass than we're ever going to have in our codes, and we're never going to be able to represent all the entire dynamic range, and we have to worry. Now, you know, uh, I think uh, some of this slide is motivated by Vo uh, Volker Springer's latest paper where he's br brought up some, you know, a well-known point but a very important point about the Galilean invariance of the truncation error of these of grid-based methods. And I think there are some interesting things to be thought about and, and talked about in terms of what that means for our applications. So here's a simple example, Raleigh-Taylor instability. Uh, I'm not going to go through all those instabilities. Let me just give you one example. The Raleigh-Taylor, the classic instability of a heavy fluid sitting on top of a light fluid. Uh, the heavy fluid is being accelerated. It could either be through gravitational or it could be a real acceleration. The light fluid is pushing against the heavy fluid and trying to accelerate. It's a buoyancy instability. The heavy fluid drips down into the light fluid. The light fluid bubbles up in between. This calculation involves magnetic fields, and so the interface is very, very smooth uh, and is affected by the magnetic tension. The, the stability analysis, which is exactly the same as what we did before for the linear dispersion relations of waves, namely you substitute in the, the wave-like solutions, you find a dispersion relation, and then you, you, uh, you, c you calculate the frequency of the waves. And if you do that for this initial condition of a light fluid supporting a heavy fluid, you get this, uh, this growth rate uh, for the, for the uh, Raleigh-Taylor instability. For, for, this is for waves in this medium, they have a uh, a quantity related to the frequency called it the growth rate, which is uh, given by this form here. So let's have a look at this. If this is greater than zero, it's unstable. For hydrodynamics, that means B is zero, that term goes away. This is always unstable when H, rho H is bigger than rho L. When the heavy fluid on top of a light, it's always unstable, and every wave number is unstable, and the highest K have the fastest growth rates. The shortest wavelengths grow the fastest. So whatever your grid resolution is, that'll be the fastest growing mode for this instability. With a magnetic field, well, 
if B is perpendicular to the magnetic field, or to, sorry, the wave number is perpendicular to the magnetic field, you get no change. This term goes away, and you're back to the same hydro condition. But when B is parallel to K, or sorry, K is parallel to B, then there's some, uh, for, for uh, large enough K, this term can stabilize. This term will be large and negative, and so the overall quantity in the brackets will be negative. This will be stable. So for large K, you stabilize that. It's for small wavelengths, it's stabilized. Magnetic field stabilizes short wavelengths. And you can see that by doing a nonlinear calculation. You can set up this exact initial condition. Light fluid, heavy fluid, uniform magnetic field. Give it a, a white noise spectrum of perturbations. Uh, you expect long wavelengths to be stabilized, short wavelengths to be unaffected, uh, <laughs> other way around. Short wavelengths to be stabilized, long wavelengths to be unaffected. Here's the hydro case. The growth is at the grid scale initially. You get very small uh, bubbles which merge into larger bubbles, which merge into ever larger bubbles, whirls upon whirls. You get turbulence and a turbulent mixing layer in the hydrodynamical case. You get you get secondary instabilities, cage instabilities that produce these little smoke rings as they wrap around the bubble as it rises up, and, and these secondary instabilities produce turbulence. In the MHD case, then the linear modes predict that perpendicular to the field, so the field is in the X direction here, perpendicular to the field is no change, you get very short wavelength modes, parallel to the field only the long wavelength modes persist, so you get these what look like flux ropes initially, and then as time goes by and you go into the deep nonlinear regime, uh, you get these very large bubbles that grow and so forth. So, so here is the kind of evolution that codes are useful for because predicting the difference between these two analytically is, is essentially impossible. The only way to investigate this kind of the dynamics is to do these nonlinear calculations. So you're building codes that can investigate these kind of problems and understand what this means for astrophysical phenomena, for example, uh, mixing inside stars uh, and other uh, mixing uh, of an accretion onto stars. So maybe I've spent too long on this, but why did I talk about waves, shocks, instabilities? Because they're fundamental properties of fluid dynamics. And if you're going to understand the numerics, I mean, why are you doing simulations at all? You're doing simulations to understand a physical phenomena. The phenomena you're studying is fluid dynamics. You better have some basic understanding of fluid dynamics if you're doing hydro and MHG simulations. And moreover, you'll see that in future lectures, these things make excellent co-tests because you know analytic solutions in some cases that you can compare against. And finally, these instabilities lead into turbulence, which really is the application domain that most people are studying in their, in their simulations. And so we want to understand how instabilities transition into turbulence. Okay, so, uh, so we're at breakneck speed here, and we've made it through the basic fluid dynamics. Let's talk about some basic numerical methods, which will lead us into the more advanced methods and codes in the next two lectures. How do we solve these equations? I mean, they're daunting. They're nonlinear system of hyperbolic conservation laws. Where do you even start with this kind of a system? Well, for a grid-based method, you start with a discretization. You break up space into a set of finite cells. In the X and Y and Z coordinates, you break it up into a finite number of cells, NX, NY, and NZ. And you take the continuous independent variable X and you turn it into a discrete uh, independent variable, X, I, Y, J, Z, K. It's standard nomenclature to use I as the index of X, J is, as X2, and uh, K for Z. This is like Brian Kernighan was saying yesterday, follow the same, uh, I mean, if you write codes in which you use different integers or different, different uh, uh, letters to represent these, you're going to be very confusing to many, many people because uh, these are just what people use. Uh, I learned it at the knee of my advisor and he learned it at the knee of his advisor, so hopefully you're learning it at the knee of your own advisor to try to stick to, to, to conventions here. You discretize time into discrete levels as well, so the, the, uh, the, the other uh, continuous independent variable time is turned into a set of discrete points Tn. The separation between these time levels is not necessarily constant. It's the time step and it may vary. Uh, the separation between these coordinates, uh, delta x, delta y, and delta z, for the moment will take as constant and it makes the analysis much simpler. It doesn't necessarily have to be constant. So uh, with that discretization, you then represent these 
dependent variables, density, velocity, energy, as either pointwise value. So for any one of these quantities A, you give it the superscript N to denote the time level and subscript IJK to represent its location on the grid. And that could either be the pointwise value, that is to say the continuous function or the, the, the true solution A evaluated at the point XI, YJ, ZK, and at time level TN. Or it could be a volume average where this discrete quantity A of IJK of N is actually an integral over one cell the integral over delta x, delta y, delta z of this function A divided by the volume of that cell. And that will be the volume average. So you're just averaging the quantity within the volume of a cell and you're storing that volume average quantity within the cell. And the difference formula that you generate depend very much on which choice you make here. And uh, we'll see that we're going to choose this volume averaging uh, because that's what allows you to conserve quantities uh, uh, in our next few lectures. So then we have to introduce uh, some other basic properties of numerical analysis, things like we're going to have round off error. Uh, we can't represent all real numbers. I understand this is basic stuff, but I think it's useful just to catalog it all. Uh, so when we do, we're doing floating point operations on the computer, we're not going to be able to represent all real numbers, so some sort of rounding must be used. Rounding is said to be correct if no machine number lies between x and its rounded value x prime. I do some floating point operation, it gives me the actual answer should be x, but I can't represent x in uh, floating point uh, precision, and so I have to round it to x prime. If there's no number that lies between x and x prime uh, representable in the machine, then that's correct. And you would be surprised at how many machines do not do correct rounding. And uh, I believe there's a program, is it Paranoia, that you can download that to check your machine to make sure that your processor uh, does rounding correct. Uh, f so, for example, Java doesn't do rounding correct. Uh, that's a serious issue if you want to do scientific computation in Java. So different languages can make uh, different choices and different assumptions about how to do this properly. So it can be rigorously proved that the relative error of a rounded value is always bounded by a number we call the machine precision. And this is the absolute fundamental aspects of numerical analysis. If this were not true, then we would be sunk. If we could not put bounds on the errors due to round off error, we would be sunk. We wouldn't know what to do with computers. But because we can, we have a hope of doing numerical analysis. This is the basis of all rigorous analysis. Numerical analysis is a perfectly rigorous branch of mathematics. It's the branch of mathematics involved with approximation and, arithmet uh, and arithmet uh, arithmetic with finite precision numbers, and that's what we're trying to do here. So round off error is one source of error, truncation error is the next. We're trying to approximate true analytic solutions with algebraic operations, because that's all a computer can do. It can only add, subtract, uh, and you can do that, and then you can multiply and divide with, a, with uh, add addition and subtraction. So it can only do algebraic operations. Numerical algorithms are approximations to analytic functions based on algebraic operations. That introduces truncation error, uh, as uh, has been introduced by some of the previous lectures, and truncation error is not related to the finite precision of the machine, it's related to the algorithm that we're using, the assumptions and the approximations we're using. It's under your control, and your, uh, most of the work in numerical analysis is trying to minimize the truncation error subject to other constraints. I mean, as Scott pointed out this morning, Minimizing the truncation error is not always the best thing to do. Sometimes there's other physics that's more important. And in addition, uh, once we've defined truncation error and round off error, we can begin to think about uh, concepts of consistency, convergence, and stability. We must have that the truncation error decreases as the resolution is increased uh, for our method to be consistent. And our method must be convergent in that it should approach the analytic solution as the resolution is increased. Uh, if your method is not convergent, then it, uh, it's unlikely to be useful uh, for, for applications. It, uh, it must be at least first order convergent. And a first order convergent method is often extremely useful and pretty good. So we don't, we don't necessarily demand that this be the most important thing that we have an nth order method, but that, that, is, that is convergent. In fact, higher order methods, uh, while in general are better for smooth flow, as this slide suggests, 
there is reasons that, uh, to believe it can be a problem. What matters, for example, is the absolute error. Uh, the coefficient in front of the leading order truncation error term is important too. So if you build a second order method which has a very large uh, error uh, coefficient in the error term, that might be more diffusive, less accurate than a first order method which has a smaller coefficient in the error in front of it, at least at low resolution. As you go to infinite resolution, the high re resolution method, or high order method always wins. But at low resolutions, at the practical resolutions you can do on a real computer, sometimes lower order methods might be better. Uh, moreover, for discontinuities, all methods are first order. And the global error in your solution might be dominated by the discontinuities in the flow, not by the smooth solution. So sometimes it's more important to get shock capturing better and to be less diffusive uh, at a shock front. Uh, that will reduce the global error in your solution than it is to be higher order uh, because all methods are first order for discontinuities. We'll talk about stability a bit more, especially uh, on our last lecture when we talk about radiation hydrodynamics and implicit methods. So I'm going to skip through some of these, I think, given the time, because these really are basic. Uh, you know, we t how do we start generating approximations to these equations? We use finite difference thing. We approximate the derivative by a, uh, a, a, a difference. You know, evaluate the function at a small step size away, take the, the difference with a, a value at f at x over h. That's the first order finite difference. Uh, you can also use center differencing where instead of just using x plus h, you center the approximation around the point x that you're trying to approximate the derivative. And it turns out that, uh, so here's the, here's the picture of where we're trying to evaluate the derivative of f at the point x. The forward difference uses the points ahead and that point, and so the difference is centered halfway between. But the center difference formula gives you the approximation at the point x, and it's one order uh, higher in, in it, its convergence properties, and so it's more accurate. So for free, you get a, a one order of a convergence higher. And you can do some simple test problems, like calculate the derivative of x cubed uh, numerically using forward differences and center differences. Well, I mean, I hope you know what the solution is analytically, so you can compare the numerical solution to the analytic solution, calculate the error, and then vary the step size, h, and you see that the error converges as the step size gets smaller, at a slope which is equal to the order of the method. For first forward differencing, it's one. It's a first order method. For center differencing, it's two. Eventually, you get down to round off error, and then that dominates the solution. That increases linearly with, with the grid spacing. And you might think that round off error will kick in at you know, 10 to the minus 8 or something in step size, because this is single precision, and you can represent numbers down to 10 to the minus 8. But again, round off error propagates uh, uh, when you do floating point operations. And the best you can do is the square root of the machine precision when you're evaluating functions like this. And so it kicks in at much, much smaller values of step size than you might, might expect. Uh, and so there's an example x squared. Uh, the second order method here is completely dominated by round off error. Why is that? This guy converges down at first order. That's the forward differencing. The, the second order method is dominated by round off error from the very get go. Because it's exact, because this is a uh, derivative of x squared is x, and you can represent a uh, linear function exactly uh, with the second order method. So the, the second order differencing is exact. It only has round off error. It has no truncation error for this particular example. So it's only got round off error in it. And you can construct higher order derivatives just by taking the derivative of derivatives, the finite difference of finite differences, and you get the second order methods. So let's turn this into uh, solutions to the linear advection equation. Let's take these methods and build a ma an algorithm for solving the simplest hyperbolic differential equation we can imagine, the uh, linear advection equation. This one here, du dt is some constant uh, plus is uh, plus some constant a times du dx is zero. And the simplest finite difference formula you would take is the forward difference in time and the center difference in space. Uh, for, for uh, the spatial derivative here, uh, and this gives us so-called forward time center space, FTCS. This is an algebraic formula we can use to approximate this differential equation. We can perform a von Neumann stability analysis on this. That is, we know that this equation here has analytic solutions, and the analytic solutions to this difference formula must be of this form here. Uh, again, this comes from the theory of differential equations. You can use your ODE course to uh, 
to look up and realize that all of the analytic solutions to this function must, uh, this difference formula must be of this form. Where C here is some complex amplitude, uh, and K is the, the you know, wave number of the solution. Uh, if I substitute this into the final difference equations, you get this form for the complex amplitude, C. And what you notice is that this complex amplitude has a norm which is bigger than one for all time steps, delta t greater than zero. For the method to be stable, the norm of C has to be less than one. Why? Because you see, this is the, the time iteration u of n is just this function C to the nth power. If, if the norm of C is bigger than one, if I take it to the nth power, eventually it's going to diverge. You know, some function bigger than one times itself n times is going to diverge. So the norm of C has to be less than one for this method to be stable. And this method is only stable if I take a time step which is equal to zero. It's a so-called unconditionally unstable method, which is sort of the, <laughs> you have to be proud of yourself when you develop an unconditionally unstable method. I mean, we all deal with unstable methods. To make it unconditionally unstable, you've done really well. Uh, so this method is completely useless. Uh, it will never work except for the non-evolutionary problem. But remarkably, if I make the simplest of changes, if I just approximate this quantity here, at the old time with the average uh, of the quantities at the old time, I take this and replace it with this average j plus 1 and j minus 1, uh, I get what's called Lax Friedrichs. And I do have unknown stability analysis on Lax Friedrichs. I get this result for the complex amplitude C. And notice that it has a norm less than 1 if this a delta t over delta x is less than 1. So if my time step satisfies this criteria, if I take a sufficiently small time step, this method will be stable. If I take a value that's too large, it will be unstable, but I won't, I'm not that stupid. I'll take a value small enough and it'll be fine. And this is the so-called Courant dv Friedrich stability criteria. Why does this work and the other one didn't? All I did was change one quantity in the equation. Well, you can rewrite this difference equation into this form here. Just rewrite it as this uh, forward time difference. And here's the center time. This is just FTCS, these first two terms here, plus this term here. I just added uh, a u of j at n and subtracted a u of j of n on, on the two uh, sides here. And what does this look like? It looks like the fine difference approximation to a second derivative uh, where the uh, difference sorry, the, the diffusion constant in front of that term, kappa, is just delta x squared over 2 delta t. So this is actually the finite difference approximation not of the linear advection equation, but to this mixed PDE, which has a diffusion term on the right-hand side. The, the constant of this diffusion uh, term is dependent on the time step in delta x. So we've added explicit viscosity. We've added a diffusion term, and that makes this algorithm stable. It's, we've solved a modified equation. We're solving a slightly different equation than the one we started with, and that makes this, this algorithm stable. You can, uh, you can come up with other methods, uh, upwind methods. Uh, you know, so let's do better. You know, let's keep trying to do better. We can try upwind methods. We can try uh, realizing that the solution to the advection equation is just the original solution displaced by uh, A delta T. So the, the solution is always moving in one direction or the other. It suggests that this, this spatial derivative should be one-sided according to the direction of the flow. If the direction of the flow is coming from the left, I should take a derivative upstream on the left-hand side. If the flow is coming from the right, I should take the derivative from the right-hand side. So when A is bigger than zero, I take U of J minus U of J minus one. If a flow is coming from, uh, if A is less than zero, I take u of j plus one and u of j. I switch between these two depending on the sign of A. And that leads to the first order upwind method. And remarkably, this can be rewritten in a form which is exactly the same as Lax Friedrichs. That is to say, it looks like FTCS again, forward time, centered space, plus a second derivative uh, here. But the coefficient is changed. It's adding explicit diffusion once again, but now kappa is slightly different. It's a delta x over 2 compared to what it was in the last slide. So uh, how do we compare these two things? You know, how do we compare the amplitude of kappa in upwind methods versus Lax-Friedrichs? Well, define a CFL number, the ratio of the time step 
to the maximum time step you can take and, and still satisfy the CFL condition. Uh, we call that the CFL number. CFL number has to be one or less for these methods to be stable. Well, if C is less than one, if you, uh, and you compare kappa in this case to kappa before, you'll find that the diffusion you were adding is smaller. If C is equal to one, they're exactly equivalent. That is to say, if I go back and if I substitute in for delta T, uh, delta X over A, I will get exactly the same diffusion constant as I got with the upwind method. But if, if delta T is less than X over A, then this method is adding more diffusion. The diffusion constant is larger than what it is in the upwind method. So uh, the upwind method is less diffusive for any practical delta T, because uh, you, you you're not going to be running a delta T equal to the CFL value. Those are all first order methods. You can do better. Uh, you can build second order, and that's what mostly we're going to be talking about in the next few lectures, is about how to build ever higher order methods. One uh, higher order method that's useful to know about is so-called lax wendroff Not only is it useful because people use it and it's good to understand what they're doing, but also because it demonstrates sort of a different kind of error, as we'll see in a second. You can derive lax wendroff in many different ways, but maybe the, the best physics way to see it is to realize that you, what you're really doing here is characteristic tracing. You can interpret the finite difference equations, the FDEs, using characteristic tracing. Remember, we're solving the linear advection equation. The solution is just the original solution displaced by an amount A delta T. So at some level, Tn plus 1, I want to know the solution at these points. What is it? It's just the solution that it was at Tn interpolated to the position which has moved to my current grid location. So this, this position right here in the solution at Tn moves to my current grid location in my time step delta t. So what I really want to know is what is the solution at this point right here, and then use that to replace, you know, put that at the value at that grid point there. If I just use linear interpolation, I mean, the problem is that I don't know what the value is here. I only know what the value is at these points here next to it. So I have to do some kind of interpolation to get the value here. If I just do linear interpolation between these two points, I get lax Friedrichs. If you just work through the algebra, do the linear interpolation, replace the solution there, you get lax Friedrichs. If I do quadratic polynomial fit to these points to get this interpolated value, I'll get lax Wendroff. Lax Wendroff is second order because it's using a higher order interpolation to get the solution at the old time level in this characteristic tracing method. And if you uh, and this is the actual difference formula. It looks remarkably similar as to before. It's forward time. Here's the center space, and it adds this diffusion-like term. But it has a smaller diffusion coefficient, which decreases more rapidly with grid spacing. It's higher order convergent. But Lax-Wendroff and Lax-Friedrichs and upwind methods have very different properties in their truncation error. Uh, we saw already that the finite difference equation approximates a partial differential equation, we call it the modified equation, that's different than the one we're trying to solve. You could show that easily with Lax Friedrichs. Lax Friedrichs actually solves a mixed PDE, a mixed advection diffusion equation. That's what Lax Friedrichs is really approximating. Uh, so clearly, Lax Friedrichs is going to add diffusion error. That, that term's not supposed to be there, but we put it in there in our difference equation, so clearly we're adding diffusion to our solution. So we're adding diffusion error. But you can, you can show that the error added by lax wendroff or that is to say the modified equation that lax wendroff is solving, is not a diffusion term on the right-hand side. It's a fourth-order derivative on the right-hand side. And that introduces something called dispersion error. It's not just a fusion term. It's a dispersive term. So that if you take a pulse, if you take a Gaussian shape at time equals zero, and you advect it using lax Friedrichs, it diffuses away into this, this uh, lower pulse shape here. And uh, you know, that's not what you want to happen, but it's sort of acceptable. You know what's going on here. This is what lax Wendroff does to that exact same problem. Here's this Gaussian pulse, and you, do, you advect it around the grid a couple of times. It preserves the amplitude much better. It's second order accurate. It's not as diffusive. It looks better, but it introduces this ringing in the uh, also, uh, and that's dispersion error. The different wave numbers have different phase velocities in the numerical solution. They propagate at different speeds. The pulse disperses. This pulse contains a combination of many wave numbers 
and they've dispersed apart and given you ringing. And this can be a real problem. For example, if this is the density and this is zero, then lax wenderoff is going to give you negative densities for just an advection problem. So dispersion error can be a real problem. In fact, physically it can be more, you know, more uh, difficult to deal with than, than diffusion error. You're always trying to minimize diffusion error, uh, but you can live with it. Dispersion error is something that can give you real headaches. Question. Exactly. So, you know, if, you're, if you say, well, lax free, Wenderoff is great because I know how to do it, it's easy, I don't want to give it up, then how do you save this method? You add diffusion. You're going to add explicit diffusion to lax Wenderoff to get rid of this kind of behavior, which is going to push you back towards being more like, you know, better to come up with a method that doesn't have dispersion error so you don't have to add diffusion to fix it in the, first, uh, in the long run. Okay, so, and moreover, there's an, another knife edge here, and that is, you're going to add diffusion to fix it, but you're going to add just, just enough. But how much is just enough? Well, that's a problem-dependent thing. And it leads you into the difficulty of not adding enough. You know, you do a simulation, your code runs for 20 hours and crashes because you've got negative density. So, oh, well, you turn up the hyperviscosity and you run it some more and maybe it crashes and maybe it doesn't. How do you ever know what the right value of diffusion is so that it's just enough to fix the problem but not so much to make the solution inaccurate. That's always an issue you're having to deal with. Exactly. There's sort of no, once you go beyond one dimensional linear advection equation, once you get to systems of nonlinear equations, there's no rigorous analysis that you can use to say, this is how much diffusion I need to fix it. And it will work in all cases. It becomes an experimental process different for every application. Uh, n <laughs> maybe, maybe. I mean, it, so we're going to get, that's a separate issue as to about how, doing, how you do higher order interpolation in a way that potentially gets rid of this dispersion error. So that gets us into different concepts of, of reconstruction, TVD and so on, as to how to get, potentially get rid of some of this dispersion error. So I'm only talking about lax Wendroff in its sort of cleanest, most basic version here. And there are ways to fix it, including diffusion, uh, and maybe higher order central schemes, which are sort of based in lax wind could also have other ways to fix this as well. So finally, uh, next to last slide, I think. Uh, so we saw that uh, we can introduce different kinds of error, diffusion error, dispersion error. Uh, we can also have to worry about nonlinear terms. Uh, there's another skeleton in the closet, if you like, in these difference equations that we've just been looking at. Namely, consider a nonlinear advection equation, still in one dimension. Uh, simplest is Berger's equation. Let me just take the uh, Jacobian here, the, the characteristic velocity, to be u itself. Uh, instead of just some constant a, let's make it u. So this, is, this term here is clearly nonlinear in u. So this is called Berger's equation. It has the and uh, you may have encountered this before in your differential equations courses. It's a very interesting equation because it's a model of shock steepening. It looks a lot like the nonlinear terms in the Euler equation, the momentum equation. And if I take a sinusoidal velocity profile, uh, if, so if I take u to be a sinusoid, what I will find is that will turn into a sawtooth uh, with discontinuities in a finite amount of time because this term produces steepening, just like in the Euler, just way steepening, just like in fluid dynamics. Suppose I just naively take this nonlinear advection equation and try differencing, say, with first order upwind methods. Upwind because it's our best first order method that only has diff diffusion error. It's better than Lax Friedrichs and it doesn't have the dispersion error of Lax Wendroff. Well, I would, uh, let me begin with the discontinuous initial condition, which the uh, velocity is one for every grid point labeled by i less than zero and zero for every grid point greater than, than zero. Uh, and I just use my uh, upwind uh, difference formula. Since u is always bigger or equal to zero, I should use the form that looks to the, uh, to the which way is that, left, uh, your left. Uh, so I'm using this form here. So notice that the difference between the grid points is zero everywhere. So that is to say this difference here is always zero except at one grid point. If I stand on this point right here, uj, then uj minus 1 is 1, and I get a non-zero difference here. But look what I do to it. 
I multiply it by u of j, which is zero. I clobber it by my current value of the velocity, which is zero, so that term is zero, even at that grid point. So everywhere in the domain, this is zero. It'll just sit there and do nothing. It won't move. Of course, the correct solution is for this, this thing here to start moving towards the, the right and steepening in some weird way, and I'm never going to get that. Uh, Right-hand side is always zero. never evolves. So how do we fix that? It turns out the best way to fix this is to use the conservative form when we solve these nonlinear terms. That is to say, rather than differencing this form of the equations, rewrite it as du dt plus df dx is zero, where f is the flux, u squared over two. And then if I adopt an upwind difference formula where I compute the flux just using the, you know, the grid information, it'll, that'll work just fine. I'll get the correct solution for this nonlinear term. Now, computing the fluxes for systems of hyperbolic nonlinear conservation laws, that's going to be complicated. And that's where we're going to involve Riemann solvers and all sorts of complicated ways to compute accurate time average fluxes in nonlinear systems. But the concept is here. The, why do we do this? We adopt the conservative form because it gives us the right answer for these nonlinear terms and enforces conservation properly. Okay, so this is my last slide. Uh, I spent most of my time, I think, talking about MHD. But I think it's worth it because to understand the methods and certainly to understand applications, you got to understand the most basic properties of MHDs. And I consider these to be the, the highlights that everybody should understand at a very intuitive level, uh, waves, shocks, and instabilities. And moreover, they're appropriate to discuss here because they make excellent code tests. And you can understand the tests, you've got to understand those, those phenomena. And then the discretization is the key here. I introduced finite difference methods. I started talking a little bit about finite volume methods. We're going to talk a lot about finite volume methods in the upcoming lectures. There's also something else that I didn't talk about, finite element methods. That leads to, again, a different kind of class of, of difference formula. The point is that the ultimate equations you're solving depend on the discretization you choose. You choose that at the very, very beginning. So be aware of what you're doing from the very beginning and how it affects what you're going to, what the method you're going to get at the end. And finally, uh, there were some warnings about nonlinear terms and discontinuities that are going to be important as we get to full methods. Okay, so uh, I will see you again uh, soon when we talk about more advanced topics.